It's my privilege to introduce our first uh, speaker, on, uh, John. I was a longtime friend and a board member, um, Richard Sarnoff, who's chairman of the Education and Media Practice at KKR. Richard. Sui generis. You may have been told that there will be no Latin tonight, but I'm compelled to start with a simple expression, sui generis, one of a kind, in a class by itself, without equal. Now that expression does not apply to John Katzman, <laughs> but I thought it would be an impressive way to start this introduction. Now, Actually, that phrase might well have been invented for John, with whom I've been close for, dare I say this, most of his adult life, the good part after he met Alicia. I have the pleasure of knowing John as an entrepreneur, as an executive, a sportsman, and a family man, as a co-investor, a business leader, a political activist, and an industry polemicist. And through all of those lenses, I can tell you, there is no one that likes John. No, I didn't say that right. There was no one like John. Public speaking is complicated. And now, a Lifetime Achievement Award. That tells you two things. That the person has done a lot of stuff, and that the person is not young. But John is one of the youngest people in mind and spirit you are likely to meet in this life. So I'm going to briefly touch on a few of the singular achievements that he's had and a few of his character traits, which have certainly not faded as he has matured, is not the right word, uh, evolved in the intervening years. One of those is John's force of will, a formidable quality that is certainly one of his hallmarks. And this adamant tenacity goes a long way to explaining his competitive drive, his financial success, and his exhilarating and sometimes exasperating personal style. His focus and mental energy also has a magical quality. Remember, if you build it, they will come from Field of Dreams. John kind of lives that, and more often than not, they do. John is a bender of minds, maybe a bender of rules when they do not make any logical sense, and certainly a bender of the entire education sector from both the provider and the consumer sides. So a word of advice, if you disagree on something, do not argue with John. Don't even try. He's usually better informed. And if not, well, it'll be a Pyrrhic victory anyway. I grew up in the same city as John and was at the same class at the same university, the one whose name he, let me be careful about the word choice here, annexed, adopted, embraced uh, to start his first business, the Princeton Review. But I did not really know him at that time. By the time I joined his board representing the minority interest of Random House in 1999, the Princeton Review was already a leading player in test prep, and John was a best-selling author on the subject. From there, as you all know, he went on to advance and disrupt higher and lower education by founding 2U, and now the noodle empire of companies, funding a couple of dozen ed tech startups and influencing many dozens more, including numerous not-for-profit organizations with his incisive and unconventional thinking across the education landscape. I have never seen anyone go from idea to action as quickly as John Katzman, and never seen anyone back up his concepts with his capital so boldly without equal. And what is it like to meet with John? Well, many of you already know this. If there are 100 entrepreneurs in the room, I would guess John has already met with 80 of them. In fact, just follow John around this conference. It's like we're all metal shavings and John is a magnet. So what's it like to actually have that meeting? First, there is punctuality. Don't expect too much there. <laughs> then there is his fluidity of expression, it can run on a different track from his quality of thought. John has this technique of the pregnant pause. He takes those to full term, 
and often inserts them right in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> but what comes out is often breathtaking. He will reframe your issue, recast your argument, reinvent your business. And he may offer those views while simultaneously playing online Scrabble on his laptop. It's a restless mind, you might say. Discussing how to solve a problem, big or small, can be analogized to shooting an arrow at a target. Most will offer advice on where to aim, on what equipment to use, on how to factor in the prevailing wind. John will sit there with a mental stick of dynamite and a match and say, have you considered blowing up the target? <laughs> Sui generis. Like so many of you in this room, I feel privileged just to know John and to call him a friend. And it's especially gratifying to have known him over the years and companies and boards and causes as such a lifetime achiever. No one deserves this particular honor more. So please raise a glass to John. And now, please allow me to introduce and turn over the podium to Nicole Neal, who works closely with John in cooking up the various noodle enterprises. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It is my honor to be here. Um, I think that um, if you know John, and I'll talk a little bit about the things that you know uh, that you know about John and some things that you don't. There he is. <laughs> so the first thing is that if you know John, you know that he has a love-hate relationship with Diet Coke. <laughs> he is either drinking it all the time or binging himself off of it. Um, also, if you go to a meeting with John, you know that the meeting is always going to be interesting because he's usually a couple of conversations ahead of everyone else in the room. So that's always fun. The other thing that's interesting about John is that he is fond of workout meetings. If you've ever kind of uh, gone to our Chelsea office, you know that we will do meetings on treadmills. And, um, and he does that because, well, that's efficient. Um, but some things that you don't know about John is that um, a couple of, and, and some things that John don't know, doesn't know um, himself is that I lost my dad uh, several years ago. And um, the best thing that my, my father gave me, aside from unconditional love, was this kind of understanding of what excellence looks like. And so imagine for a moment that you are overseeing four companies, you're on multiple boards, you're a mentor, you're a dad, you are a husband, a, a husband you're a brother, you're a son, and you're a friend. Most people would mess that up but not John. What excellence looks like is you give your level best to every single company that you've invested in. You show up for every meeting, even if you might be a little late, <laughs> but you show up for every meeting. You deposit into the people around you. And you work long weekends even when you don't have to. I had the pleasure of, of kind of looking at what excellence looked like, and what that did for me is it pushed me. And I don't know that John knew how much that pushed me. The other th important thing I want to talk about is that when we started Noodle Markets, John did something very special. He sent emails to his colleagues and to his friends, and he said, hey, this is Nicole, my brilliant CEO, help her. And many of you out there probably got that email. And why that's important is that if you think about what Phyllis Lockett and Jamie talked about yesterday, we talked about how do you break down barriers. And so here John is, this education entrepreneur giant who takes this African-American woman, high heel wearing nerd, <laughs> underneath his arms. And he treated me like family. He mentored me. And he pulled me up. And 
He did that from his heart. And I don't know that I have ever had the opportunity to say thank you. So I say thank you. And you are so deserving of this award. And I will turn the mic over to Brian right now. Howdy. It's great to be here with all of you to celebrate John Katzman. I'm Brian Napak, and I oversee a company called John Wiley & Sons, a 210-year-old publishing company devoted to knowledge development and education. I've been hanging around the education business for a very long time, but not as long as John. For over 35 years, John has been challenging the status quo and annoying the intelligentsia in education with pesky, disruptive, and occasionally transformative ideas. All along the way, he's been improving the lives of learners and creating significant value for investors. I entered the education business in the late 1980s when the latest innovation was putting shiny foil covers on Sally, Dick, and Jane textbooks. At the time, the most exciting new educational technology was the video disc. Some of you may remember that. A Nation at Risk had just been published. This seminal and controversial report set the stage for over 35 years of educational reform, innovation, and the promise of investment in education. But from far before A Nation at Risk, John sensed the need and the opportunity in education and set about improving it almost single-handedly. From those first 15 students that John prepared for the SAT in 1981 through the building of the Princeton Review, which revolutionized test prep, to the founding of 2U, which helped universities to revolutionize where, when, and how they delivered education, to the creation of the Noodle Companies, which is rethinking most every part of education from top to bottom. Can I pause a second? How about the magnificent plurality of the Noodle Companies as a startup? It's as if John is saying, anybody can start one company. I'm gonna do three, maybe five. I don't know, we'll see where it goes. Anyway, for decades, John has been confronting the status quo, saying mediocre is not good enough, redefining what outcomes mean in education, and reinventing how we seek to achieve those outcomes. And all along the way, he's been challenging, stretching, and kind of annoying all of us. All of us who thought we had the right answer. Because for John, there is no right answer. There's only the best answer for right now that we can come up with so that we can fight like hell about it try it out, see if it works, and then immediately start the process of tearing it down and coming up with the next disruptive idea. I've had the pleasure of knowing John as an entrepreneur and as an investor. We've all watched John the Entrepreneur. Sitting alongside John the Investor is really a window into who John is and to why he's so great at what he does. Together, we've listened to innumerable pitches from excellent entrepreneurs who've painstakingly put together presentations uh, for all of us. And the pattern in these pitches is always the same. The entrepreneur starts his or her carefully crafted pitch. For a few blissful moments, they tell their fantastic story while we sit back and listen. They think, think things are going just great. And then John, without warning, seeing a flaw in the logic, raises a skeptical brow. You know the brow. There it is. he launches into a merciless fusillade of questions and challenges. Fast and furious they come. The entrepreneur has barely a moment to catch his breath and respond before John challenges again, transforming, reframing, rethinking, usually giving the, the entrepreneur ideas they never had when they walked in the room. The inquisition invariably goes on until the entrepreneur either relents in despair or time runs out. One English aspirant, as he slumped dejectedly toward the door, was heard muttering, I'm reminded of Gallipoli. <laughs> no sooner had that entrepreneur left the room than John blurted out, I like it, let's invest. <laughs> and therein lies the magic of John as the investor and the entrepreneur. It's the magic is his unbridled skepticism, which is only outweighed by his boundless optimism and his deep belief in entrepreneurship and the ability of a mission-driven entrepreneur to change the world. 
My company Wiley has been around since 1806 when Charles Wiley opened up a bookstore in Lower Manhattan. Over the years, we've published Melville, Dickens, Einstein. No, John, I'm not comparing you to Einstein. So in preparing for tonight, I thought I would go back to the deep archives for some inspiration. And happily, I found a terrific letter from John, from John Wiley to his father Charles in 1815. And if you don't mind, I'd like to read a little bit of it to you. Dearest John, a most fascinating young man came into the bookstore today. He wandered around the store and seemed quite agitated and a bit displeased. He announced himself as Master Jebediah Katzman of the Upper East Side. When I asked if I could help him find something to read, he responded quite forcefully. He said, Gutenberg had it all wrong. Democracy is doomed if the public had to rely for their learning on our leather-bound books, which he called hopelessly outmoded. He proceeded to lay out an intriguing plan for the reinvention of knowledge and acquisition, knowledge acquisition, better education that he said he would deliver to all citizens, not just the elite. He went on to describe in detail a company that he had just established to deliver this vision. For more than an hour, he spoke in a most animated fashion, whirling and gesturing while painting a bizarre picture of the future that I could barely envision. He closed by saying that for $159, we could get in on the ground floor of his new, new, new venture, the Amsterdam Review. In all, this man seemed quite mad. I think I shall invest in him, your son, John. We've got a long way to go to make sure that everyone has access to the blessing of a high quality education and that we all get a satisfactory return on investment for our investments in education. But for our nation, still at risk, in need of better, more effective education, I'm happy John is out there. John is a living testament to the power of creativity and an unwillingness to accept the status quo as good enough. Personally, I love the idea of a lifetime achievement for John. Lifetime Achievement Award for John. It's like the Oscar music coming up while Meryl Streep thanks her dry cleaner. As if to say, hey John, step aside. Let some of the rest of us change the world for, for, uh, for now. Unfortunately, I know that John's just getting started. And as long as there are problems to solve in education, John's going to be dreaming up solutions and asking if we might invest. With that, I'll turn the floor over to my partner, my friend, my advisor, and absolutely the least opinionated person I know, John Katzman. Thank you, thank you. I, uh ran a team marathon, like a relay race, a couple weeks ago, and I realized very, very quickly that I was by far the slowest guy on the team, and that would be me tonight. Um, but I have a, a deck, because I always have a deck. <laughs> ah, so thank you. And, uh, and specifically, we start by just making sure that everybody here properly appreciates um, the role that, that Deborah and Michael have to coalescing this community. It's more than a conference. Global Silicon Valley is all about creating an ecosystem that's global, and that is us to change education. And they have <laughs> also want to thank, you know, ideas are fine. Uh, it's about execution. And, uh, and I've worked with some extraordinary people, um, many of them several times. Like people say, well, you've put together some really good teams. Actually, I've put together one team and I just keep moving it. Um, but, and every so often somebody sticks with the old company and some new people come in and, and join the team. But it's, it's been a great uh, honor. Um, so I have a question for you guys. Um, just to cap the night. Um, a master's program, as it says, is 40,000 bucks, and, uh, and only about half the people who, um, who could benefit from it can afford it. And of course, there's all sorts of, uh, of opportunity costs as well. It's a, a year of work. Um, you invent that helmet, and that helmet in 30 seconds 
and a dollar worth of electricity can teach, or a penny, um, can teach everything, all the skills, all the content that were in that master's. And, uh, and you've made a $10 million investment, and let's just say you've already recovered it because, because Gates paid you. <laughs> and the question for you guys is, how would you price it? How would you price a zap of the helmet? And I've now asked nearly 100 of you, um, all sorts of uh, folks. And don't game it, because I've heard all of them now. No ISAs, uh, whatever they are, uh, Tonio. And, uh, and with just an average price, assume that you'll give financial aid as, as, as appropriate, but, but the, what is the average price? And just think of a number. Like, I know all the theories from a marketing point of view and so forth. Um, how would you price it? And here's the thing. The answers I've gotten ranged, many people said free or a dollar. A bunch of people said $75,000 or more. And there were answers every place in between. And it wasn't a normal distribution. It was just all over the place. This is the only industry where that would be true. The healthcare industry, which is the closest to this, um, there's health insurance, and so it's not quite the same. You don't feel as bad about charging somebody. And, you know, if I invented uh, the ability to make this podium for uh, a penny, nobody would say, well, how do you price it? Well, you should only price it at a penny because we need podiums. Like, like, there's no other industry like this. And it's not just that each company has to make this decision. You've got employees to the left of you. You've got venture capitalists and PEs probably to the right of you, although I've, I haven't seen a great pattern in who's going to, uh, uh, to say what number. This is the only industry where it really is kind of a random walk. And educators, traditional educators, nonprofit folks who tend to be on the uh, left side of you, are going to look funny at you even if you're charging only 1000 So I think we have a really interesting problem, a really interesting community. Um, and more and more, we are developing a vision for where we're trying to take the world. How much money we're going to leave on the table, that's a question. What it looks like is starting to come into focus. And it is a compelling community. Um, I'm, I'm not dead yet. Uh, I so enjoy working with all of you and, uh, and hope to continue doing that, although this award suggests that somebody knows the license plate of the truck. <laughs> um, so thank you. <laughs>